and there was a large meeting, and I lost my temper in front of everyone, and I, I exploded in anger. He said, that was the end of my ministry there. And I looked back and realized I forfeited the, um, the moral right to lead those people when I just exploded in anger. And I uh, talked to another man about that, and he said, that happened to me too. He was talking about that. So this uh, anger issue um, is, is, a, is one that we have to deal with in ministry. And there's Moses, disobedient in his anger. Number three, Gideon. Gideon was doubting. He was unsure. God told him exactly what to do. And then he, he kept saying, well, if you really want me to do this, here's the fleece. Please uh, uh, you know, cause, cause the fleece to be wet on one side and you know that. Put out the fleece. And um, he was doubting. He was unsure. God used him to create things through Gideon. Number four, this is the one that really surprises me. Barak. Barak. He was unwilling to lead. Deborah led the people. And then Jael won the victory. Remember, a tent spike right through Sisera's head. And so Deborah and Jael had to step in. This is the one that's interesting to me. Guess whose name is listed in, um, in Hebrews 11? Barak's listed there, too. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I, I, I don't understand how that works. But uh, Barak is listed there in Hebrews 11 also. Number five, you know this one, David, adultery. He arranged for Uriah's death. David, it's called a man after God's own heart. One guy told me, David was a terrible sinner, but he was a great <laughs> repenter. Great repenter, David. Number, five, number six, Elijah. Extreme depression, suicidal at one point. Um, it's an interesting study to look at all the people um, in the Old Testament who said, Lord, please, just take my life, kill me. Elijah's one of them. He had this amazing victory. Uh, let's see, I did this back at the Inland Northwest, and my wife was there, Earl and Shirley were there, and the Rogers were there. What, who were the others? See, it was Elijah in this great victory. Um, uh, also, uh, Jonah had the, this amazing uh, revival, but he was upset and angry that God, uh, that God preserved all these people, and Jonah said, Lord, take my life. Um, who, what other ones do we have? That's how great it was last week. <laughs> it was so amazing. <laughs> okay, there are some other guys. Um, <laughs> trust me. There are, and so I have it in my computer, and I could show you up there. It was, it was, it was amazing last week. <laughs> but anyway, Elijah's one of those that said, I, I don't even want to live. Lord, please take my life. Please take my life. And uh, that's Elijah. And number seven, Jonah. Outright disobedience to God's command right at the very beginning of the book. And at the end of the book, he's asking for God to take his life too. But uh, Jonah. And by the way, Jonah, if you think, if only God would bring these, the most amazing uh, revival ever in the history of Squim or, or Tacoma or wherever you're living. If God, would you bring the most amazing revival? There's never been a more amazing revival uh, more amazing than what happened in Nineveh under Jonah's ministry and in chapter 4 he's wanting to die. <laughs> so isn't that amazing how our human hearts interpret things? <laughs> Even when God brings these amazing victories, Elijah, great victory, uh, he was exhausted though after the run and uh, running down the mountain and over to Be uh, Beersheba and so he said, please kill me. Jonah, oh God, I knew you'd forgive all these Ninevites. Please, just kill me. Outright disobedience in chapter 1 of Jonah. Number 8, John Mark. John Mark quit. Um, Paul was pretty disgusted with him. In fact, a uh, pretty important relationship to Paul Barnabas. They split up over this young man, John Mark. Um, by the way, he rebounded, which is a great story. Number 9, Peter. Cowardice, overcome by fear. Uh, Peter, what a terrible failure that would have been. Remember that, that passage in Luke where the Lord Jesus, I imagine him, 
Um, I actually have seen a painting of this, so that's why I imagine it. The painting is of the Lord Jesus stripped down to his waist, beaten all over the place, and he's got his, his hands behind his back, and he's looking. It says, and he looked, and, and, and he, he saw Peter. He looked and saw Peter after the crow, uh, I'm a crow, after the rooster crowed, and uh, Peter realized his failure. I denied him three times. That's, that's a real striking kind of uh, passage to me. What failure in the Bible. Number 10. Um, I, I have this listed here. I'm not sure that we ever really actually see failure, but we see this incredible timidity and fearfulness. And that's Timothy. Timothy, and can you imagine following behind the great Apostle Paul and then comparing yourself to him, wired completely differently than Paul, and that was Timothy. What, what, uh, what a sense that must have been for him. Well, let's take a look at uh, the assumption of weakness and failure in the Bible. Turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 30, 37. Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I love that verse. He delights in his way. And, and look at the assumption in verse 24. Though he fall, it's not if he fall, or he might, but if, if he's a good man, he won't fall. It doesn't say that. Steps of a good man ordered by the Lord, God delights in that man's way. Though that man fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. You see, while the steps are being, while they're being ordered by the Lord and God's delighting, there will be falls but not utterly cast down. The Lord upholds them with His hand. We won't be utterly cast down. What a blessing to reflect on that. Turn to Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, where we see uh, more assumption of weakness in, uh, and failure in the Bible. Proverbs 24, 16. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. So what's the difference between the righteous and the wicked? It's not that you won't fall, but it's that when you're down, you'll get up. And so um, the assumption of weakness and failure right there is the righteous man will fall, but he's going to get back up. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And um, here we see more about this assumption of weakness and failure in the Bible. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So we're to take heed to ourselves and to the doctrine, and then continue in doing that. Because no matter what we see, we're going to have this, as we see in verse 5, or 15, we'll have progress, may be evident. So we're to take heed to who we are as individuals and to what we believe in our doctrine, and we're to continue. So this word continue implies that you're going to have to plow through some days. You're going to have to keep going. You can't, you can't give up. Uh, the verses that are always striking to me, of course, are in 1 John chapter 1. Now we're getting to the sense of moral failure in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. I can remember studying this when I was a student at Grand Rapids School of Bible and Music. 1 John 1. Let's uh, start at verse 5. This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie, don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So walking in the light, fellowship with one another, that's so odd, the blood of Jesus Christ the Son cleanses us, cleanses, present tense, cleanses us from all sin. So, while we're walking in the light in verse 7, we'll have fellowship with each other and the blood, will, the blood of Christ will cleanse us from our sin. So, you, how can you walk in the light 
and be cleansing, being cleansed from sin. I, 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 un, I, I understand what it's saying, but it's hard to comprehend. That we'll be in the light, and while we're in the light, we'll need to be cleansed from sin. Because while walking in the light, we'll stumble. It's just kind of an almost an oxymoron that we see here. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That the truth is not in us. So if we say we have no sin, now that, by the way, is a noun. So it's like saying if we say we don't have the sinful desire, sinful nature, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So that's a verb. So one's, in, one's a noun, verse 8, one's a verb, verse 10. So no sin nature, and haven't committed the sin, in verse 10. There's again, assumption of weakness and failure. We see it right here. In the context of, of fellowship with God. Now, the next point I have on our notes, promises to remember in our weakness. Promises to remember. Look at verse number 9, wedged right between verse 8, no sin nature, and verse 10, no actions of sin. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, confess is homo legato. Legato means to speak, homo means the same. So we're speaking the same things about our sins that God says. So if we say the same things about our sin that God says, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word faithful, that's referring to what he states in his word. God is true to his word. He will forgive. If we say the same thing about our sins that he says, God is true to his word and he will forgive us. And the second uh, phrase there, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The word just there is related to the word righteousness. And so, um, here in verse 9, God is faithful to what He says and will forgive us if we confess or say the same things about our sins. God will, will be true to His word and will forgive. On the basis of that word just, on the basis of Christ's righteousness. Um, I talked here at Squim in, uh, on Sunday morning um, and we were in the book of Romans. And I mentioned 65 times in the book of Romans the words righteous, righteousness, and uh, the verb justi justified are used in the book of Romans. All related to righteousness. Uh, justified is, uh, uh, there's, no, there's no English verb for righteous. We don't have righteous eyes. We don't have that. So um, the word, the verb is justified. Righteous, righteousness, justification, or justify uh, means to be declared righteous. That's this word here, just. So you think righteousness. He is faithful to his word and then righteous, based on the righteousness of Christ. So he, God can forgive us our sins because he says he will and because Jesus Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. So God promises forgiveness and He provides the basis for forgiveness. And that is the righteousness of Christ. So if we say the same thing about our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. By the way, the context is not the initial call to Christ for salvation like I did on October 2nd, 1972. The context is not that kind of confessing sins. Look at the context again. Verse 5 through 8. It's talking to Christians. People walking in the light. People who have uh, already a relationship with Christ. If we say we don't have sin or the sin nature, we're deceiving ourselves. Verse 10, if we not sin, in the verb... We make God a liar. And right in the middle is this idea of confessing. So this is for us as Christians. If we, if we say the same thing about our sins. So we need to have short accounts with God. We need to confess our sin. 
Uh, when, when do we do that? Um, all the time. You need to do it. I, I find I'm most prone to be confessing my sin as I'm reading the Bible. In the morning, my quiet time, as we call it usually. My quiet time I'm reading, and as I'm reading the Word of God, just like I told you to read books this way, I'm reading the Word of God and say, out loud sometimes I'll say, oh God, that's me. Oh Father, forgive me. Oh God, I confess. I confess that's me. Um, angry thoughts, lustful thoughts, jealous thoughts. I'm reading that, you know, those kind of passages, and I'll say, oh Lord, that's me. And so, um, in our weakness, in our failures, even in our sin, we have a great promise. 1 John 1 9. Turn back now to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. And in Psalm 73, we're going to look at verse number 26. Psalm 73, 26. This is that amazing a, a psalm of Asaph where um, he was talking how he was looking at the wicked and, and envying where they were, what they had. They had all this going for them. And uh, then he said, wait a minute. Um, verse 16, when I thought how to understand all these things, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. And so in Psalm 23, uh, in here in the middle, right here in verse 26. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is the rock of my heart. My, my flesh, my heart fail. I, I, he's like confessing the first 16 verses. I was, I was looking at the way the unrighteous live and I was envious of them. And then I realized their end, and as I contemplated all of that, oh God, verse 26, my flesh, my heart fail. God, you're my rock. You don't, you don't fail. Oh Lord, I need you, and I'm so grateful that you are the, the rock, and you are my portion forever. Oh God. By the way, I like that, that phrase, my portion. Um, that I was talking uh, earlier this week to uh, uh, a couple of you of my own, my own life. And when I turned 60, um, it was about the at same time that our last child got through, we have five kids, our, our youngest got through, she graduated from Moody, and the <coughs> youngest, um, when she was done, all five of them, we're, we're done, and so we were done paying off all the college bills and all that. So one day I was looking at my finances because I was 60. I said, well, 65, only five years, I'll be done in the IFCA, kind of retirement thoughts. First time I'd really thought much about it. And he said, how, how are we going to do this? I had no idea financially how we were going to make it work. You can relate to that. And at that very same time, I was going through the book of Joshua. And in Joshua, um, there is the portion of that uh, where Joshua says, okay, Moses told me this, now I'm going to say this to all of the tribes. Ephraim, that land is yours. Judah, that's yours. Gad and Asher and Naphtali, all this, th that's where you go. Levites, you have nothing. <laughs> that's what it says. The Lord, because the Lord is your portion. The Lord's your inheritance. And then I started to realize, God will take care of me just as he took care of the Levites. And God will take care of you too. God will take care of you. That's a promise. In our weakness, in our inability, even in our failures, my flesh and my heart fail, but God is my rock. That's the word strength. The rock of my heart and my portion my inheritance. He's the one who'll take care of me. Oh God, thank you that you'll take care of me. And that's a promise to remember in our weakness. Turn to Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41. 
This is after that great passage in Isaiah 40. I preached it last week at the Inland Northwest. Uh, Isaiah 40, how great God is. We sang that this morning and the majesty of God in Isaiah 40 and then ends by saying, uh, the youth shall faint and be weary. They can't make it. They're weak. The young men utterly fall. They're going to fail. But those who wait on the Lord, they, they stretch out their neck uh, in kava. That's the Hebrew word in, in looking and anticipating God to fulfill His promises. They're waiting on God to do what He says He'll do. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. The idea there, shall renew, renew is the idea of the Hebrew word is exchange. We'll exchange our weakness for His majesty and His power. Our inability for His great ability. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Here's the great promise. Shall renew their strength. Shall mount up with wings. Shall run. Shall walk. There's a promise. God will take care of us and help us. Uh, that's usually where we stop. Continue on to Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not. I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Verse 13 ends by saying, fear not, I will help you. Verse 14, fear not, worm Jacob, I will help you. Fear not. So in your weakness, even when the, when the strong young men are failing and the youths are, are stumbling and are weary, end of Isaiah 40, in chapter 41, 10, 13, and 14, God says, don't be afraid. I'll, I'll be with you. I will help you. I will help you. It's, it's a great promise in our weakness. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I've already told you how I have dreams of still being an athlete. And uh, Romans 8 is one of those kind of passages that's great. Talks about uh, uh, all that we will, we will face. Um, verse 31, Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? If God's for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Well, see, God's the only one who can, but God's the one in verse 33 who justifies, who declares us righteous. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore it is also, is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. We're just falling down. Falling down in our human weakness and implied as even in our failures. Look at verse 37. Yet, in all these things, we are Cooper Nicol. Nikao, you can even hear it. You guys out here in the Northwest know about Nike. Nike means victory. Nike was the goddess of uh, victory. And, can, and so Nikao means to have victory. But Hooper means hyper. There's hyper victory. It says in verse 37, In all these things we are, we're hyper victors. We're more than conquerors. Through Him who loved us. The victory comes through Christ. Let's get even more specific. Oh, you really can't see it. Oh, too bad. It's really good stuff there, too. <laughs> Turn to 2 Corinthians. I don't know what happened to that slide. My fault. My failure. I, my weakness right here on display. I don't know how to do technology very well. And there's a bad slide. Um, if you're close, you can see that guy laying down, looking completely... Well, uh, I, I Googled. I said... Uh, image of a first century man I said first century sickness <laughs> and there, that picture came up, a painting of a guy first century, he's on his, his weak weak bed, look at the second Corinthians chapter 12 second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3, I know such a man whether in the body or out of the body I don't know, God knows how he was caught up into paradise heard in inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one, that's Paul, 
I will not boast. I will boast. Yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. Now I'm talking weakness. Infirmities. By the way, the Greek word there, I have it in your notes, asthenia. It's the complete, the state of complete incapacity, total inability, in, uh, used in context especially of, of debilitating illness, like a fever. Um, I've, been, I've had a fever a couple times in my life, Miriam can remember. Um, I, I, a couple times I was actually hallucinating. Um, I, I had such a bad fever and uh, I was hallucinating. Um, well, I was hallucinating that guys were trying to fight me and I was having to fight them. And probably they were Germans, I don't know. But anyway, my, my fever, I was hallucinating that, that there were guys trying to fight me. And um, I, I was so debilitated. Wow, did I just turn this off? Or did it go off somehow? Okay, good. Oh, there it is, thanks. I was afraid I, <laughs> in my delusions, in my, my, my delirium, I flipped it off. So that was me on a bed. I was asthenia, verse 5, infirmity. That's that word. Look, continue on. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Some people think it was an uh, affliction in his eyes. Because he talks elsewhere in the New Testament about, you know, uh, look, see what large... See what large letters I write. And they think he had an affliction in his eyes. Others say, no thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. That's talking about a person that God sent to, to humble Paul. A person, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this, whatever it is, you see it as an affliction, physical affliction, or an actual person. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, therefore most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities. In my infirmities, there's in verse nine. Verse 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So, asthenia, this complete, total inability, used three times, Paul, about himself. I am so weak. And yet, I love the passage because he then uses um, this other word right there. See that guy there? It's kind of the artwork. All right, the artwork is, forget that top. That's, I don't know what happened again on my, on my uh, oh, you can fix it? Wow, he's good. In my weakness, then Dave is strong. <laughs> so he's he's fixing it. So let's look at this. Let's look at the Bible because that's kind of what Paul did. He wrote. He didn't have powerpoints. There it is. No, oh, that's the picture I wanted you to see. There's a guy, and it's like fire and power all around him. And that's this Greek word dunamis. It's used in verse nine. Let's read verse 9 again. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, that the power of Christ may rest on me. This idea of strength and power, and then uh, I take pleasure in infirmities, but at the end, when I am weak, then I am strong. It's the Greek word dunamis, which we get dynamite from. And so the idea is that we're completely in our own strength and power, debilitated. We're so weak. God in His great power <coughs> uses us. Isn't that amazing? <coughs> to think how God takes us weak vessels and He makes us powerful, supernaturally so, in His strength. And then Philippians 3, 13 through 16, we were talking about that. Promises to remember that we're to forget the things that are in the past, failures and successes, and we're to press forward. We're to press ahead. We're to move ahead in God's power, in God's power. So, I'm going to flip Dave, I'm going to move on into the next slide. There's that, that kind of, that's us. 
we're weak and we have strength in, in Christ. It's an amazing uh, dichotomy there of uh, power and weakness and, and debilitating uh, inability and supernatural ability. So, let's look at the first, first point of my conclusion. Let's be faithful where God's assigned us. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 5, Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. In light of the recent hurricanes, I thought about being pummeled and, and being overwhelmed with hardship. And in the midst of that, we're to do the work of an evangelist and fulfill the ministry that God has given to us. So let's be faithful where God's assigned us. Paul told Timothy, fulfill your ministry. And this is a good charge for us as well. Don't ignore your weaknesses and excuse your failures. And don't dream about greener grass. Diligently fulfill the ministry where God has placed you. He's placed you where you, you are serving. And so fulfill your ministry. It's going to be hard. But endure hardship. And share the gospel. Do the work of an evangelist. And fulfill the ministry God's called you to. Number two, we should repent where we need repenting. Some pastors spend too much time on social media or reading blogs on the internet or at the golf course or hunting, fishing, or working on their house projects and in their yards and gardens or pursuing their favorite hobby or watching ESPN or playing video games on the computer or a thousand other diversions that may not be bad in themselves in moderation, but they sap our energies and dull our brains and interfere with the work God gave us to do. Um, I know one guy, the church asked him to resign because all he did, he was so depressed, the pastor just watched TV. It got so bad they thought that it, that's what he was doing. They actually kind of, one of the elders, just one night went to the pastor's house. And the wife was gone. He knew that. She was at a meeting. And the pastor was watching TV all night. And the uh, pastor did it again. And he was doing it all day. All he did was he stayed in the house. And he watched TV. And the elders talked to him and said, Pastor, what's wrong? And uh, the pastor got feisty. And this was not a good situation. This is an IFCA guy. And uh, he just zoned out in front of the TV. That's all we do. So we need to repent where we need repenting. Number three, discipline yourself for intimate, quiet times with the Lord. Maybe, you know, you have let that slide. Discipline yourself for quiet, intimate, <coughs> quiet times with the Lord for a time of confession, cleansing, and redirection from the Word. Pastor, pray to be reignited with passion. For the Lord's calling. And then number four. Then get up and get to work. Work hard. Trust in God's grace and His omnipotent power. Lord, help, help me to do better. And one final thing. Number five. Guard against the perfectionist ideal that keeps insisting nothing you do is acceptable unless it's perfect. There's perfectionists among us. I know. I tend that way. The standard which appears so noble on the surface of perfection is your worst enemy. Remember last night, Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. There in Colossians 3, it tells us to work heartily. There's the word, suitcase, for the Lord. Work heartily. For the Lord, not perfectly or nor even excellently, but heartily, from the soul, doing your best that you can. Keep Psalm 103, 14 before you. He himself knows our frame. If, if I were to have a life passage or verse, it's Psalm 103. And this for me is so vital, this verse. God knows our frame. He's mindful we're but dust. God's under no illusions about you and me. Were he expecting perfection from any of us, he would have given up in disgust a long time ago. He knows he got no bargain when he saved us. When we sin and when we fail, the only one surprised is us. 
but serve God anyway. He's a God of grace and mercy. Every day of your life, give thanks for his grace and mercy. So, let's pray that God will reignite our passion for him and for the ministry and that we will endure hardship do the work of an evangelist and fulfill the ministry God's called us to. Let's pray. Father, I come to the end of four messages that focus in on some pretty negative things. But I pray, Father, you'll help us to conclude by focusing in on the positive Lord Jesus Christ, our wonderful Savior, who we want to please. Help us, Lord, I pray. Reignite our passion, I ask. And help us as we leave to determine to fulfill the ministry you've called us to. Father, help us to do that faithfully, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.